Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for having me on. No, no extra points, no field goals, mm-hmm. no kickoffs. He said no more kicking. I, I remember when he said that. Yeah. And I can, I can see that. <laughs> yeah. Because they've, they've done everything they can to make the kickoff become the most scrutinized bit of public safety they can possibly do. Uh, for football it's they give that more attention than they give serious problems in this world yeah he was pretty funny about it. he's like so you got guys who don't even play football deciding football games you know like they're they're what? out there you're kicking field goals they, they're not even football players that's his point mm-hmm. that's what he's saying i, I saw the bit it's <laughs> yeah, pretty funny it's pretty yeah, that is pretty good that's pretty not a bad point shit. though you're a football coach in high school i am is your kicker primarily a soccer player or is he uh, really, primarily, a- no. Uh, we tried one kid who'd never played football and was a soccer player, and it was a total disaster. The kid cost us one game, flat out, completely cost us one game, uh, trying to punt. And then on kickoffs, he wouldn't listen as to who to not kick the ball to. You probably heard of the name Jordan Addison by now. You probably have, yeah. <laughs> but football fans know the name of Jordan Addison. Well, Jordan Addison, who plays for the Vikings now went to USC and before that Pitt and played at Tuscarora High School in in Frederick. And we gave this kid explicit instructions. Whatever you do, do not kick the ball. Dylan's (laughs) Dylan's putting on his headphones. Do not kick the ball to Jordan Addison. We practiced all week. In fact, I told all the kids on the kickoff team before kickoff, (laughs) you tell Grant, whatever you do, don't kick it to Jordan Addison. I said, Grant, if you kick the ball to Jordan Addison, just keep running. Turn around and run out the stadium and don't come back. <laughs> so he says to me, can I just kick the ball deep? Can I kick the ball deep? I said, no. Kid goes out, kicks the ball deep to Jordan Addison. Jordan Addison returns the kickoff for a touchdown. Yeah. When he came off the field, Grant, did you see, ever see that, the movie Airplane? Oh, yeah. Right? The line where the lady's like un- uncontrollable in her seat and everyone's like, the one lady goes over and starts shaking her. And then the guy comes over and smacks her. Then yeah. they, they go down the line. The guy got boxing gloves. He got a baseball bat like that. Yeah. That was the line of coaches waiting to greet Grant as he came <laughs> off the field that day. When Jordan Addison signed with Pitt on his highlight reel that they released on Huddle was our clip of kicking the ball to Jordan Addison. Oh, And man. I remember to myself thinking, some college coach at Pitt is probably going, who's the idiot high school special teams coach who kicked the ball at Jordan Addison? Right here. What do you got, Dill? So was that uh, Grant's last day with the team? He never kicked the ball again, of course. <laughs> <laughs> never kicked another ball. We'll see if you follow Larry David's rule, you wouldn't have that problem. Jordan uh, yeah. Addison starts on the 20, and, you know, the game begins right there. We should have just had everybody line up at the one-yard line, Dylan. Hey, Dylan, I saw you put your headset on. Yeah. What you got, man? Uh, my, my high school tended to have problems with kickers a lot of times. We had to resort to soccer wasn't, players Wasn't sometimes. Colin your kicker? I was, well, I was stepping on the, <laughs> the, uh, the thing here. Yeah, we kind of resorted to 11, 11th and 12th grade. Had to get one of the soccer players over, named Colin McLaughlin. So. <laughs> Martinsburg's had a string of uh, had a string of soccer players who've been great kickers for him. So I mean, Martinsburg's done very well with that. We've been fortunate just to have kids who came up through youth ball who kick mm. and kick well and have done well at the high school level for us. Otherwise, Riley, I'm sure you didn't come here to talk about uh, kickers and football. I mean, football. I can sure. So yeah. You started it. <laughs> Did you ever play uh, sport? I know you're, you're skateboarding, whatever. Did you I play sports football. growing up? Did yeah, you? I played football. What position were you? So when I was young, you know, when it kind of goes by weight limit, we're all kind of the same yes. group and age and all that. Um, it was defensive end, then tight end, then as people got heavier and I did not, mm-hmm. um, then uh, moved cornerback, safety, and always on the defensive the side. The traditional lighter positions. Yes. Yeah. yeah. When, when I was a kid, if your dad was a coach, you were a running back or a quarterback. If your dad was a head coach, your kid was probably the quarterback, that kind of stuff. So anybody whose dad was not a coach, you were stuck on the line. So yeah. when I was in fifth grade, I was like four foot seven, 60 pounds or seven, whatever <laughs> yeah. it was. You know, like uh, you are a defensive tackle and an offensive <laughs> lineman. I'm like, are you serious? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we need to have a whole segment discussing the nepotism in uh, youth football. <laughs> It's any sport. If, you're, if your dad's the head coach, you're the quarterback, you're the shortstop, you're oh, the yeah. pitcher, my, you're when, the point guard. My, when, when, my head coach, his son was the quarterback. Yeah. yeah. That's always how it works. When, yeah. when my son played football, the, the quarterback on his youth team was about three and a half feet tall and the coach's son. Mm-hmm. That's, you, you hit clean up if it's baseball. That's just, you know, that's, everybody knows it's kind of the deal.
right? Yeah, that is the deal. But yeah, now I played a lot of sports football. I actually did swimming, played soccer. I was not a baseball guy. Mm-hmm. Uh, didn't do baseball, but love football. Football is a great sport. It is a great sport. It teaches a lot of stuff. Yes, it does. Teamwork. Great sport. Teamwork. Riley, let's talk about uh, this interim time now between uh, your primary victory and the general election, which will come up in November in West Virginia. I know you don't want to hear this, but it's assumed the Republican will win uh, races around the state at the federal level, the state level, uh, House of Delegates, whatever. It's it's very rare for a Democrat to win now. Obviously, you can't take that attitude, but you are smart enough to recognize what the reality of the state is right now. Yeah, look, I take nothing for granted. Uh, we'll be out there working and campaigning. But that said, yes, uh, my congressional seat, which I'm running for, and the one down south that Carol Miller holds and statewide, uh, you know, these are close to R plus 30 districts. Um, I think mine's R plus 25. I think Carol's is about the same. And I mean, state. So that what that means for people is really kind of any generic Republican winning already has like a 25 point mm-hmm. advantage. And it means that's how the president uh, performed in that district in the last go around. So, uh, and that's how those are weighted. So yes, um, certainly looks very favorable, but uh, you know, look, I, I take nothing for granted. We'll be out there working. I love getting out and talking to people, especially doing the circuit. <clears throat> you know, most of my races were decided in generals, except for this one. So I'm uh, actually actually a little more acclimated to that. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. beating John Perdue to become state treasurer, uh, which was a wild race. There was only two statewide Democrats left at that point. Manchin obviously is still here now uh, for a few more months. But you know, look, he won by six points in 2016. We come to win in, by 13 points in 2020. And uh, you know, my House of Delegates race is same thing. It was always the general. That was kind of the election. Uh, this one being settled in the primary is a little bit of a different thing for me. Um, so, uh, but I think this is the way it's going to be moving forward. This is it. Um, this is what it was like for Democrats for a very long time, except for obviously a few standout uh, Republicans that were able to break through during that time period. Uh, Underwood, Arch Moore. Um, that was really kind of about it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> when you announced you were challenging Purdue, I remember the day you announced that, I thought, boy, that's a big task right there because this guy was a dynasty in and of himself. Yeah, he's a 24-year incumbent. Yeah. Yeah, and he'd won in in a Trump election cycle. So that was was a tough race, and we had COVID going on and all that. And so it made it a little difficult to uh, campaign, but that was a, um, me personally, really special uh, election and race for me because we – me and my father, who uh, was retired, he's retired now, owned an RV. And because a lot of hotels weren't open uh, during COVID, that's how we got around and campaigned all around the state of West Virginia for about almost two years was in an RV and just going around and parking the thing in Walmarts and all over the place and just going all around the state. You should have gotten yourself a wagon, Queen Family Truckster station wagon. <laughs> Oh, with the wood on the side, yes, yeah. the wood paneling. Pile the kids in the back seat, head off to Florida. Yeah, but Wally we, World. We were just hitting in an RV, going all over the place, camping out. Nice. It was it was, it was a lot of fun. That's how you get to know the people, man. Oh yeah, right. Yeah, we'd roll up in the RV. People were disappointed this cycle. My dad actually sold the RV, and uh, I remember going to a couple election stops in this uh, primary. They're like, "Where's the RV?" It's like, well, my dad actually sold the RV, so we're not campaigning in the RV this time. Somebody buying that RV, mate. Hey, that potentially could be Congressman Riley Moore's RV. <laughs> well, my father's RV. I didn't, yeah, you I didn't. did it too. Yeah. So when you're running for the U.S. House, are you finding, and you talk to people, are there concerns, West Virginia concerns, or are they mostly bigger American concerns that you're encountering? Yeah, I mean, I'd say a lot of it's driven by national trends, which really affects all of us, right? I mean, first and foremost is inflation, cost of goods and services and everything else that continue to skyrocket. The price of food at the supermarket, gasoline, any of those other things is really putting a squeeze on people here in West Virginia and all over the United States right now. So that's that's a consistent issue no matter where you go. Um, immigration is certainly top of the batting order in terms of 
problems that people see in this country, and they're 100 percent right about that. All of these things are just observable, right? Um, I, I don't know if people are aware of this, but uh, just uh, last month, if I remember correctly, uh, an illegal immigrant killed a woman in, uh, from Ranson, West Virginia, um, in a pretty terrible fashion um, here in the Eastern Panhandle. An illegal immigrant killed somebody. So it's happening all over the country. People are seeing it. Rampant crime, um, and not to mention the um, downward pressure that you get from illegal immigrants coming into this country that are off the books, that are going to be bidding jobs bottom barrel, undercutting wages for working Americans here in West Virginia and around the country. I mean, I think the end of the day, you know, we hear this phrase, which I certainly um, associate myself with, you know, America first. But I think we need to think about putting Americans first. And there has to be um, there has to be a point to being a U.S. citizen. There's been an erosion um, to what being a citizen of the United States means. What type of benefits do you get from that? And it comes with rights, but it also comes with responsibilities. And sometimes we don't talk about the responsibility side as much as we talk about the rights. But you see locations all over the United States right now where they're allowing illegal immigrants to vote in our elections. So if they can vote in our elections, if they can take government subsidies, if they can do all these other things, they can get driver's licenses. What's the point of being a U.S. citizen? Where are they allowing them to vote in elections, Ron? In New York, they voted to allow uh, non-citizens to vote in their local elections. Hey, you know, uh, you mentioned uh, a moment ago the president, and I know you saw the debate I did. On Thursday night. I don't know if debate's the appropriate word for that. Debacle? Uh, yeah. It's, it, I mean, uh, so many Elder people, abuse. Some of these people have said to me sadness. They're, they're, Sad. Their thought was sadness when they watched that. Mine wasn't so much sadness as it was fright uh, and fear. Scary. Scary. Right? It's one of the scariest things I've ever seen in my life to think that that, that man is leading our country and he, he barely knew where he was. Yeah. And, and, and John... Uh, Forty percent of the population feels the same way about Trump. So for a chunk of this country, there's no good alternative in this election, Riley, one way or the other. And I don't expect you to come here and, and, and criticize the Republican. You're a Republican and you're going to be running for office right now. And, and the, the Trump uh, name of West Virginia is pretty darn strong. But watching that debate on uh, Thursday night, so many people said to me in text form, this is the best we can do out of 330 million people. I, but, but, you know, there's the perception of Trump, and then there's the reality. And the reality is this country was doing so much better under Donald Trump than Joe Biden. That is a fact. You go look at – take a look at your retirement accounts back then. Go, I mean, we had the um, <clears throat> tax reduction, the Trump tax cuts – he was the only president, Democrat or Republican, to challenge China, to actually try to put our trade relationship with China on even footing. Democrat, Republican, whether it's Bush, Obama, Clinton, whoever, nobody did anything about that. He put tariffs on steel coming from China, and he was tough on China. He's the only president that's done that. We had no wars that we were involved in under Donald Trump. So if you take those things and just put them on a piece of paper and not attributed to Donald Trump and the way that their life was under Donald Trump, I think everybody wants to vote for that. Now, they don't like that he says certain things on Twitter or this or that, but then there's the reality of what this country was like under Donald Trump. And I think it is, he was one of the most successful presidents who had all of the headwinds in the world against him during that time period, and in my view, one, he's going to win, and two, when he wins, I think he's going to set this country on a very different path that is going to bear fruit uh, for decades to come. I have to, um, I have to agree, and I go even even farther into the weeds. Americans, when you go to the grocery store and you look at what you're spending now compared yeah. to what you spent then, and that, I mean, that's the base. Some, I mean, some especially poorer Americans don't have 
retirement accounts. They haven't seen the up, the down, but every single American sees food. And there yeah. are so many people that are, are, are close to starving. There are children, there are families. I mean, all of us in this room are lucky. I mean, we complain about it. We go, oh my gosh, look at what I'm paying. And then we pay for it anyway. But there are so there are countless Americans that aren't doing that, that aren't able to feed their kids. And this is and this is the lie that is perpetuated by the Biden administration when they say we've got the best economy, the inflation is low. <laughs> okay, I'll give them but I'll give them that the inflation is low now after the damage is done. And people are supposed to just not believe what they know. That right. life is a lot more difficult now than it was before. And just get over yourself, they say. You know, this is, you're not really suffering. It's, it thing, things are better than you think they are instead of addressing the real problems. Well, I mean, that's, this is the typical Democrat um, move here is to control observable reality, right? I mean, you see that as it relates to this whole transgender issue. Don't, you know, I mean, it's all my own perceived, re my reality is your reality. So you have to recognize whatever my reality is, right? And it's the same thing with inflation. No, it's it's actually it's better. It's better. It's better. Uh, better compared <laughs> to what? Um, you know, go look. Go try to buy a home right now, okay? And go take a look at the interest rate environment here. And what it has done is stymied now. Unfortunately, for a generation, is upward mobility in this country. They've done that. They have done that because they they just burned cash down there to the point where we had to have quantitative easing to try to literally put us into a recession to try to cool off the hyperinflation that was coming. That's why they've ratcheted up these rates. That's why they had to do that. Hey, before we run out of time, I know you had some news about the Treasurer's Office. You wanted to get out there, too, for folks. We've got about three minutes left. Time to attack from your position as Treasurer of the State, sir. Got to put on my glasses for this. <laughs> so, Welcome um, to the club. <laughs> The, uh, I, I get a lot of questions about this as it relates to Hope Scholarship, and there's this trigger that just happened yesterday, July 1st, and had we gone over a certain amount of Hope Scholarship students, then the Hope Scholarship was not going to be available to everyone in 26-27. Uh, I'm happy to report we did not go over that threshold. That threshold um, would have been 12,416 students if we were over that number. Uh, the Hope Scholarship would have not opened up to everybody, but as of July 1st, yesterday, the number of Hope Scholarship students we had was 9,523, and as uh, mandated by law, we write that number down, and that number now has told us, and we have sent letters to the governor uh, today, actually, we're sending letters to the governor, uh, Speaker of the House, and the Senate President, that we did not exceed the number and so now the hope scholarship mandated by law will open up to every student whether they're currently in home school or private school in the 26 27 school year do we know what the amount uh, will be riley or is that to be determined you know i do fiscal notes on this and that's kind of if I'll give you a worst case scenario, because obviously every year we're paying for more students. So if we took every homeschool student that exists and every private school student that already exists in the state of West Virginia, we'd probably be looking at an additional $125 million to pay for this program, which I think is well worth it since we're already, yeah, got to think about it. Look, that's about $5,000 a student that we're paying to educate them. That's our state uh, portion of the money we're already paying to educate them in the public school uh, setting uh, these are taxpayers they do pay for this whether they're in private school or homeschool or otherwise I think it is well worth it uh, the investment in our children's future to be able to do that every time we do one of these teacher pay raises by the way or across the board pay raises it's roughly 200 million dollars mm -hmm. um, I don't think 125 million dollars for the children of the state of West Virginia in perpetuity is a bad investment. I think it's a great investment. And on that note, we stop for uh, our final commercial break here. Treasurer Riley Moore, our guest on the program.